moving forward, we got Tom with us, who is going to talk about a pain point that he came across and how he solved that. And he's also going to help us uh, learn a bit more about GDPR. So Tom, over to you. Thanks so much, Harshil. Okay, folks, the boring part starts now. We talk about uh, laws and regulations. Let me share my screen and uh, we'll dive right in. Um, it's not that many slides and actually I'm not a lawyer, so it will be fairly short, don't worry. Um, uh, in, just in case you, you're not familiar with GDPR, like it's a term that has been in the news for quite a while. This is like a EU, European Union regulation. GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. Um, but if you're not living in an English speaking country, you might know it under slightly different terms. Like I've listed a few here and there are many more, but I don't speak many more languages. So uh, there you go. Um, the GDPR mostly grants certain rights to individuals. Uh, so we as a company, NITN, do have no benefits from NITN, but uh, lots of things we need to keep in mind. And uh, that will be the same as soon as you process any, any personal data. Um, uh, but you as a user can benefit from GDPR. You can uh, ask companies to do something and they have no choice but to comply with your request. Uh, and we'll go into what this would be in a second. Uh, it has also been like uh, mocked by a lot of people, but has been quite a success actually. There are a few international regulations that uh, mimic most of the GDPR features. If you live in California, you might have come across the CCPA. Virginia is currently think on the, on the road to releasing their CDPA. And they all cover uh, kind of similar things. So um, even if you don't have GDPR yet in your country, this might become relevant eventually for you. Now, why would we care about this? Um, and this is now my, my very personal perspective on this. Uh, individuals have the right to request uh, the erasure of the personal data from companies, organizations, government agencies, and so on. This is also known as the right to be forgotten. So if you don't like uh, us storing your data, you can come to us and say, hey, please delete my personal information. Uh, we then have a deadline of one month in total. Um, and that is because we're data controller, right? So you give us your personal data and we control it. We might um, uh, give it on to subcontractors to, to further process it, but we still have the obligation to make sure it gets deleted. Uh, within a month. There are some extensions possible, but I'm not a lawyer and the gist that I learned after reading through this is you have one month and don't even try to get these extensions. Um, so that's the deadline we have. Non-compliance can be very expensive. Um, so I've listed the fines there. It's up to 20 million or 4% in annual revenue of the company, whatever is more. So it can be quite, quite expensive, though I have not heard of, of the, the highest uh, uh, fines. Uh, being issued in the past. Um, and one thing that I've noticed over the last month and uh, was that it's a business. It has become a business. There are service providers out there that help you uh, enforce these rights. So uh, one of the service providers would scan your email inbox for any suspicious messages from companies and would then email the companies for you and request the data deletion for you. Um, and on the same side, the, the very same service provider would go to companies and say, hey, do you need any help with... Uh, data deletion, we can assist with that if you pay us money. So um, yeah, it has become a business and that has uh, led to a noticeable increase. And now, uh, how did we deal with this? Um, this is a timeline on the left. You see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Obviously this represents four random days, not all requests come in on a Monday, but it kind of kind of realistically represents the timeline we have. Um, so Monday, a request might come in and it would uh, I'd then just read the email, acknowledge the request, go to the nicer services, have a pleasant UI where data deletion isn't really a problem. Um, next, I might reach out to other teams that control their own databases and services. And I say, hey, guys, can you please delete this, uh, the data related to this user ID? Uh, then a whole day is reserved to deal with nasty services and there are quite some. You, you wouldn't believe that. There are services that don't let you search users by email address or by any ID you use internally, but require using their own ID. Um, so just very few services make it, make it very slow sometimes. And on day four, that is usually the, the timeline we were looking at. The stuff is done. Confirm deletion, all good. On the right, you see like some of the screenshots from my internal documentation. Um, as you imagine, this was quite a lengthy process and not much fun. So um, here's a few reasons why the old process uh, wasn't much fun, wasn't great. It's error prone. So you might imagine when dealing with lots of IDs, lots of different numeric IDs, it might all look similar. It's easy to mix them up. 
even when copying, when working with email addresses, just imagine you, you leave like a white space at the beginning of a field or at the end of a field that obviously will no longer match a user record when talking databases. So um, simple. Uh, where humans, lots of human work is involved, there's lots of room for errors. It's also slow for obvious reasons because, um, well, there is uh, other stuff to do, not just deleting data. And that's also intransparent. Um, because, uh, like, imagine I start on Monday, then get sick on Tuesday, like, no one knows what has been done with this deletion request, uh, what needs to be done. There is also typically no lock at the end of what has happened when something has happened. So it's very intransparent. And now, obviously, working at N8N, we couldn't keep it like this. So how does the new process look like? Oh, darn, I wanted to switch. That's, that's it. So it has become a simple slash command. And... Um, uh, now deletion is as simple as issuing this uh, Slack command. And suppose this is very boring to show. So let's uh, do a quick demo. This is the wonderful workflow. Um, it looks a bit convoluted, but part on the left is mostly handling Slack commands and keeping it flexible slash commands. So let's see, actually run the workflow. And now let's request data deletion. As I said, this would be the command. And um, we have little Wally here confirming that he's on it. I really like Wally because he's cleaning up stuff, and that's exactly what the workflow does. And now switching to the workflow, uh, we can see that it has received the slash command. The first step then is some basic validation. So um, Slack does attach a unique token to each request, and uh, that can be used by receiving servers to validate the request. Right? So I'm just comparing tokens here. Um, then I use a set note to format my data a bit, and that is because the information coming from Slack is very comprehensive, right? Lots of data I'm not interested in. I don't really want to work with. It's just confusing me. So I'm using a set note here to simplify it, basically in an operation and in an email, um, because that's all I need to know here at this stage. And then I use a switch note. And the idea is to keep this workflow easily extendable. So what this workflow does is it reads the operation. And then depending on which operation has been selected, it routes the execution to one of the outputs. So far, it only supports the delete operation, but it can easily be extended, right? So you could easily add a new rule to also process information requests or whatever you have in mind by just connecting it to another output. And all of these paths also have error handling. So if at any stage validation fails, um, would send an error back uh, just to uh, let the user know, or in this case, like if the token fails, I'm just um, responding with an empty body. But uh, in, other, in all other cases, you would get a nice and uh, talking error, like telling me this email address has not been found, telling the user how to actually do this. And now let's assume everything is working, like here. Um, we just acknowledge the request. This is the first Wally message saying that's it. Um, we then call sub workflows, and this is what I really enjoyed working about working with N8N here. Um, all these sub workflows process the deletion in a single service. So this workflow is easily extendable and also uh, customizable. Imagine I no longer want to, uh, we're no longer using customer.ao data. I can simply remove this node and the workflow would still work as expected, right? There is not much more to it. If you need to integrate a new service, you can also execute another workflow, another sub workflow here and doing this using the execute workflow node. This is like a powerful node that just uh, runs a sub workflow and uh, keeps it nice and clean. And now after all these sub workflows have executed, I'm just preparing a nice log entry. I'm then uh, hashing the email address. And uh, why do I do this? Obviously, um, I want to keep a record of what I've done, right? When my manager Max comes to me and says, okay, Tom, what have you done last week? Uh, okay, so like nothing really, or I've deleted data, but I'm not allowed to keep logs of it. Um, so to not run into this situation, I actually do keep logs, but uh, without personal information. So what I'm doing here is I'm calculating a hash value based on the email address, and this is the value we'll uh, use thereafter. Um, this also helps in case uh, something does come up. So this wasn't just my work. This is a collaboration with workflow. Tomazina and John, both from the N8N team, have helped here. Uh, they have worked on, on each of the sub-workflows on getting some of the legal information around this. And one of the problems we really had was, okay, what do we do about our affiliates? So people who would usually get money from us, um, they might reach out and say like, hey, can you please delete my data? And uh, now what? Uh, does this automatically end the business relationship or not? So these were questions that had to be answered. 
Um, turns out, in case you're curious, yes, if you ask a business partner to delete all your personal data, you're no longer a business partner. You can no longer expect to get paid because uh, there is no more data for you on file. Um, a lot in case complaints come in later and say, like, hey, why did I not get paid? Uh, I could, again, calculate this hash value and say, like, hey, that's because you have deleted the data deletion a few weeks ago, a few months ago, or whatever. Um, and then the last steps are really simple. I append this data to Airtable, um, which is where I keep my log in this case, and then respond to Slack. Now, the response looks like this. So you can see, like, uh, has finished, shows me the status with a nice green check mark if it went OK. Actually, it's called white tick um, or red cross and a red X if it failed. And it also has like a deep link to the add table log. So I can take a look at how that looks like. So here we have the email hash as the uh, unique identifier, keeps notes of all the data that has been deleted. And this would also be where um, it would lock any problems. So we will take a very brief look in one of the sub workflows in a second. In case any problems would have come up, uh, this result would not have been done, but instead it would have say error and uh, the notes field would contain details of the errors. You can obviously um, like customize the logs if you have more in-depth requirements, but I think for now this is a good enough process. You now set customizable teamwork. This is a single workflow, but there are also lots of these sub-workflows, and they are what uh, was really fun about this process. So let's open the Zendesk uh, uh, workflow here. So you can see this is how one of these sub workflows look like that delete data. And um, you can see this is actually a credit to John here. I've deleted the actual deletion, I've disabled the actual deletion just to make sure I'm not uh, accidentally deleting any data while uh, demoing this. Uh, but you can see like um, this first node again sets the incoming data. It uh, also sets some dummy data in case, uh, which is a really cool feature of NIT and it lets you use JavaScript, so I can run the sub workflow on its own if I wanted to test or debug it without uh, triggering it from the parent workflow. So what I'm doing here is I said uh, I take over the email field that I get from the parent, but if it doesn't come through, I just set my dummy email address here just so I have something to work with. Uh, so this workflow would be able to to run, and then it's just like any other workflow, no dark magic here. Uh, first checking if uh, delete if this is a delete operation, if not, return an error checking if the user exists, if not, return success, because technically um, not every uh, user might exist in Zendesk, right? So a non-existing user is a success case from the deletion point of view, like don't have anything to delete. This was still a success, uh, no error. Um, and uh, afterwards, I delete all my data. I'm not doing that here actually, but uh, in the real world, I obviously would delete data here for real requests. So if you ever reach out, I promise I will delete your data, but uh, <laughs> not during a demo. Um, and that is basically the idea. So um, to just reiterate on these uh, key points for collaboration that I've just mentioned, um, how we split up the work was we used sub workflows for each of the services that we need to delete data from. We agreed on a consistent data structure. So we defined how does incoming data for each sub workflow look like? How is the outgoing data for each sub workflow look like? And keeping it readable said this, I have some notes with the default names, but most of the notes do have readable names that just describe what they do. So I avoid keeping notes um, that are just uh, called HTTP request or if without anything else. So um, where to go from here is, is my final slide. And uh, then you are all about my GDPR deletion approaches here. Um, a uh, thing I was thinking about was implement additional GDPR processes. You've already seen this uh, switch now that I'm using. Um, but funnily, if I have not seen a single information request coming into NIT, and, and it would be rather boring if you've ever signed up to any of the services. Like if you use NIT and Cloud, we ask for an email address and a uh, nickname, and that's it, right? There is no exciting data to request, I suppose. Uh, that's why no one would ask for that. Um, please don't ask for this now because <laughs> be lots of work for me um second thing is build a ui like i personally love slash commands but not everyone else might um so i was thinking maybe a simple form uh uh teflon dude has already shown that in a previous community meetup which is really cool how to serve simple forms with n at n so i was thinking about um uh making that possible and the last thing is um connect to manual operations. So not every team you're working with might want you to update their production database. So the idea was 
Um, you cannot send out Slack messages from NHN or MetaMost messages that attach buttons where people can confirm once they've done something. Um, and this is something I wanted to work on next. And um, that's how we currently handle GDPR deletion at uh, NHN.